It's been two years since Barry Morphew's wife, Suzanne Morphew, has vanished. And it's believed that she's dead and her body is yet to be found. There was a 48-hour special this past weekend. You may have missed it or maybe you can't get it. So today I'm going to do a little recap. It starts out by talking about when Suzanne went missing. It was a nationwide search and how she went for a bike ride or they think she went for a bike ride and didn't come back. They mentioned that from the outside, the family looked perfect. They're laughing, they're smiling, but it was far from that. According to Barry Morphew on May 9th, it was a happy day. He said they had a nice dinner, they were intimate, and then he went to bed. When he woke up the next morning on Mother's Day, May 10th, he said that he just left and Suzanne was sleeping. He left for a job in Broomfield a few hours away. While he was gone, their two daughters, Macy and Mallory, were also gone. And people who were asked about this and about Macy and Mallory being away, they said that it was rather odd that the daughters would be gone on Mother's Day as well as Barry. And Barry texted Suzanne that day without a response. He said, Happy Mother's Day. Barry was also in contact with his daughters that day and there was no trace of Suzanne. In the special they talked about the Morphew's neighbor was contacted to check in on Suzanne to see where she is and she wasn't there, her vehicle was, but Barry had suggested to see if her bike was there and it wasn't. Authorities would later find Suzanne's bike in the ravine not far from home and the initial thought was it was a kidnapping. Then in the special they focused on the spy pen. They talked about it was found in the master bedroom and it looks like a regular pen but it does record conversations and it was given to Suzanne to record Barry to catch him in an affair and it backfired. It recorded Suzanne and Jeff and in the special they said it's clear that he was her lover. Now a little side note because I wish they would have included more in the special. They really focused you know on the spy pen at this point. They talked about how it caught Suzanne being the one who was having an affair. But it was suspected and uh, from my understanding known that Barry did cheat on Suzanne before. And they didn't talk about how he had, I guess the word is uh, looked up on the internet, that he looked up things like young girls in Salida and things like that. So I wish they would have included that just to make it a little bit of an even field because they made it more about how it backfired on Suzanne and they talked about Jeff Liebler who was her lover. So it's true that she was having an affair with this Jeff guy, but again, they didn't mention that and I wish they did. They talked a little bit about the search just months after Suzanne went missing. Her brother Andy Mormon actually headed this search and they just touched on it a little bit. Now, they went back a little bit and said, you know, Barry and Suzanne, they grew up in Alexandria, Indiana, where they met. Suzanne competed for homecoming queen and Barry was in baseball and an injury, uh, you know, hurt his career because he was drafted to the Toronto Blue Jays. It said they went to university at Purdue and married in 1984. And Suzanne taught middle school and then became a full-time mom and stayed at home. And while this happened, Macy was still living at home. She was 16 at the time, but Mallory was away in college. So when they moved to Colorado from Indiana, uh, they moved to be closer to Mallory. And Melinda was actually seen throughout this special and Melinda is Suzanne's sister. And she said that she received a text from Suzanne. It, she says it was lengthy, very powerful, and very revealing. This was two days before she disappeared. And the text read, he's also been abusive emotionally and physically. I feel more angry now, anger at what I've allowed. Melinda said Barry was very dominant in the relationship. She said her sister was a passive, gentle soul, and he had a great tendency to overpower and intimidate people to get what he wanted. Then they flashed to one of his workers, Cody Cox, and he described Barry and said he's real quiet, stern. He said he knew what he was doing because that's what he was doing in Indiana. 
and we know that Barry had a landscaping business. And Cody said that Barry was actually an inspiration to him and he was a real cool guy. He said he regularly heard Barry speak on the phone to Suzanne and he said they seemed to communicate pretty well. He said, I met Suzanne a handful of times. She made cookies for my wife and kids. He said, she's a sweetheart, real kind lady. She's almost like an angel, someone you'd see off of a Hallmark movie, almost too perfect. He said he heard the news through the radio that Suzanne was missing and he said, oh my gosh, who would even want to hurt her? Good question. They went back to the scene of where the bike was found and they talked about it was found over a cliff and resting on boulders and that she was new at mountain biking and said that an accident was plausible. And the thing is though, she wasn't found, her bike was, no helmet, no biking clothing. You know, they found the helmet one mile away west and the thought was it was thrown out of the window. More on that in a minute. They then flashed to Barry's 35 second plea or 25 second, I think it was, plea, which was, in my opinion, ridiculous. But they talked about it and they talked about Tyson Draper, who recorded Barry, if you remember, I guess it would be, you know, almost two years ago now. And he secretly taped Barry. And Barry talked about the mountain lion theory. And they said on the show, well, if that happened, you know, there would have been signs of that. And that was a very short-lived speculation. And it was a crazy week for Barry because not only did Suzanne go missing, but also he brought up this theory of a mountain lion. Then he realized this wasn't gonna work because Suzanne's brother Andy flew out and said, you know, Barry, it's not a mountain lion. You need to get rid of the mountain lion theory. It's not a mountain lion. So he quickly changed that into an abduction. And then he was pushing out the $100,000 reward, which became a $200,000 reward. He made that uh, video without any help from the authorities. He decided to do that video, which has all kinds of complications in itself, in my opinion. And, and so that's what happened there. They talked about finding the driver's license and credit cards in the Range Rover, which is Suzanne's vehicle, and her cell phone was missing, and then Barry was interviewed by investigators. Now, Ashley Franco, who's a reporter, she was throughout the 48 hour special, and she talked about reading the documents and how Barry has repeatedly told the same story about he came home the 9th at 3 p.m. and had a pleasant evening. How convenient. And then the next morning that he saw her in bed which he did have some discrepancies because he said he saw her in bed and then he said he kissed her goodbye another time. So, I mean, he does have discrepancies throughout. Then they go on to talk about Jeff Liebler and they said that he was hard to find and said that she hid the affair so well that it took six months for them to find Jeff. And they said that at one time, there was a one-time fling between the two of them in high school. And then obviously Suzanne got married to Barry. And Suzanne, after moving to Colorado, reached out in 2018 to Jeff on Facebook and said, howdy stranger. And then they've been talking every day uh, nonstop until she went missing. And when she did go missing, Jeff went quiet. And once the authorities located him, he, from what it said in the, uh, the special, that Jeff took steps to delete social media accounts. And those were the accounts he used to communicate with Suzanne. And he said he didn't want to tarnish Suzanne's memory and lose his family and his job as he has six children and was married. And he was worried that they would see him as a suspect. And he asked the agents, literally, am I a target? So. He did though agree to DNA and passwords and phone records and um, he had an alibi and it checked out. So the agents looked through his iCloud account and, uh, and his phone accounts and pieced together the relationship, including when they met in person because there was a few times and Suzanne would leave Colorado and go on some trips and they would meet. And they went and met in Louisiana and Florida and they said also there was intimate photos and they talked about being husband and wife and talked about moving to Ecuador at some point. 
Now, obviously, this was a big focus with authorities to figure this all out and what happened to her on May 9th slash May 10th. And it's interesting here, on the Saturday, Suzanne and Jeff messaged 59 times that day, and it was said it was much more than usual. And Suzanne sent a selfie. That was her last known picture or proof of life. And at 2.05 p.m., she said, I'm just in love with you. What you up to? Then the text says, want to strip down and get naked, LOL, question mark. And she goes to say that she's going to go on WhatsApp. And so at 2.11 p.m., she says, okay, I'm on WhatsApp. And at 2.36 p.m., Suzanne gets a text from Barry. And he says, done, headed back. And she doesn't answer. And so then Barry texts her and says, did you leave? With no response. Barry returns home at around 3. And then they find Barry's cell phone is pinging everywhere on the outside of the house. And the question is, was he chasing Suzanne before, you know, the final moments of her demise? And when Barry was asked to explain, he says, I was probably walking around my house shooting chipmunks. And he bragged before. Uh, they didn't talk about it in this special, which, which I wish they did. He talked about shooting, you know, 83 chipmunks, I believe the number was. And, but they did say on the special, which I loved, they said, world's first chipmunk alibi. And it kind of reminds me of the Daybell case when Chad talked about the uh, raccoon theory, or he just said, you know, woo, had, a, had an interesting day, I shot a raccoon. And this very much reminds me of something similar. Well, yeah, you know, I have to back it up. So I'm, I'm saying that I ran around the house and on the outside and shot a bunch of chipmunks. They didn't mention either in the special, which is, again, I think is very important, that Barry also used that he was looking for a turkey that Mallory shot before on that day. So there's turkeys and there's mountain lions and there's these chipmunks and then there's elk, but I'll talk about that in a minute. So in the special, they talked about Barry doing 30 to 40 interviews without a lawyer, including talking to the FBI. And Jeff was cleared, as I mentioned earlier, and the alibi checked out. And Barry, though, denied knowing about the affair, which is interesting because it does seem like, hmm, all of a sudden this affair is amping up. And I wonder if Suzanne that day, because there's 59 times, if she's just like, I've just had enough. Because she did text the Monday before that she's like, you know what, that's enough, it's over, I've had enough, I could care less what you're doing. And then boom, within a week she's dead. But there was a text, and that text that I'm talking about was actually deleted on Barry's phone. And it says, I'm done. I could care less what you're up to and have been for a year. We just need to figure this out civilly. So they mention in the show that Barry knew the girls would be away camping, obviously. And authorities say that he took advantage of them being gone. And one thing that I've hit on numerous times besides the triangle is the fire that occurred on the Monday uh, that, that's right near Barry's home and it said in the documents that at first it came in as a um, human caused fire and then it was changed. So it's very interesting and I am going to compare now my notes. I may even show you what I have on it since it's been a while and, and compare this to the time of this text because I'm very curious at this point um, how, this is, how this is lining up. It's been something that's been ignored in the public. I think it's important. Let me know what you think. Now at 2.47 p.m. on Saturday to 10.17 p.m., Barry's phone goes into airplane mode. And authorities say that the reason why it went into airplane mode, they believe that's when Barry was disposing of evidence. And interesting too in the show, they talk about a relatively new technique, which is digital vehicle forensics from Barry's truck the telematics from it. And they said they were using Barry's own vehicle against him. And the best is that they did a poll in the middle of this show that says, do you believe Barry Morphew's chipmunk alibi? I think I'm gonna use that and put it in a poll and see what that uh, what the results are. And maybe I'll put it in another video so we can see what those results are. 
I think I know the answer, but you never know. So back to these vehicle forensics. These are helping find bodies. They're finding um, or helping people get convicted and not convicted. And that's what they said on the show. And they said it's accurate to use in court cases and around the world. So it makes me wonder too, and I, I wanna ask about this in my Justin Evans case, there was a car involved and I wonder if they even bothered with any telematics on that. I'm guessing no, just because the way the investigation has gone and it's been quite interesting. But with the data from the car, uh, from the prosecution, they think that Barry snapped at one point on the Saturday, the day before Mother's Day, and he killed Suzanne that afternoon. And he told authorities though, which was so interesting, that he went to bed at 8 p.m. Remember, they had a lovely evening and they went to bed together, had some great times, and then went to sleep. But at 9.30 p.m., according to the truck data, the truck was put in reverse and it was moved 96 feet closer to the house. So convenient that he fell asleep at eight when 9.30 his truck was moved in reverse, maybe it was the chipmunks or the turkey, and it went closer to the house. Now investigators think that's when he could have moved Suzanne's body, which is quite possible. And he said he'd set alarm at 4.30 a.m. the next morning and drove to Broomfield 150 miles away. But the truck shows someone opening and closing the truck doors at 3.30 a.m. And they said there was a four hour window though from four to eight where there's no activity recorded by the computers. When the CEO of this company was talking in the show, about the lack of info, he says that sometimes the data can get overwritten. So I don't know exactly how that's happened. They didn't go into detail. Now, Barry also took a left instead of a right to go to Broomfield that morning. And he says that he remembered seeing elk, so he wanted to take a look. Funny enough, that actually puts him in the vicinity of that helmet that was thrown away. So think of it, he wakes up in the morning, even though he's been active through the night and 3.30, uh, it shows on his truck. And then he leaves and he takes a left. Well, why is that? He's taking his helmet, which really when you think of it, when it was the abduction theory, it really didn't make sense either that her, hel her bike was at the spot it was and that the abductor is just gonna toss her helmet out the window. It's very ridiculous. Not to mention that that same week, Barry was seen looking through garbage cans for her helmet. And I wanna say something too about that fire. Remember we are talking about the fire? That fire was also in the vicinity of where that helmet was. So it's in a triangle. He desperately wants everybody to see the, the bike, my opinion, the bike, the helmet, and maybe you didn't want to see the fire, but when I knew there was a fire there, uh, that's been covered up quite good. But again, in my opinion, but it, it's interesting. And he also talked about men's clothing at Fusis, and that was down south, right near the, the house. So again, in this triangle, he really, really, really wanted this theory to work. Now back to the show, uh, they said that at 8.10 a.m. on Sunday morning, they believed that the truck began recording data and Barry's cell phone came on. And it said that they could see that he pulled over at a Broomfield bus stop and discarded something in the garbage. Then he goes on to do a bunch of dump runs. He chucks stuff in a hotel trash, into McDonald's, uh, dumpster and at men's warehouse and back at the hotel and so he's disposing of garbage in these different places and they do have him on surveillance now he says it's just another day it's just him being cheap he's not a criminal he says I always have junk I don't like to pay for getting rid of it so I go to these different spots and so you know, five different spots later, he's getting rid of things on the most important day that Suzanne went missing or weekend. 
I should say. So Barry went after these dump runs, checked the job site out, then back to the Holiday Inn where he was staying. And he stayed from 12.42 p.m. to 6.03 p.m. In my previous video, I worked out the timeline and worked that he was up all night. So no wonder why from 12.42 p.m. to 6 p.m. he, uh, you know, was stayed in the hotel. He was sleeping. And I'll, I'll give you some of those videos in the description box below or maybe right here if I find this timestamp through. But then that's when the Morpheus neighbor was contacted. No sign of Suzanne. Bicycle not there. And then Barry asked the, the neighbor to call 911. But Barry doesn't come home immediately. He drops tools off for his co-workers and includes a shovel. And then one of his workers took over the room, which we heard Jeffrey Puckett talk about that before, that it smelled like chlorine. So did Morgan Gentile. They said it was so, so, so strong in there. And Barry, after 6 p.m., starts driving back. He speaks to the deputies and it said he was pretty emotional when he first arrived and they found the bike. And by Sunday night, their daughters came home. Barry then offered that $100,000 reward like I talked about and later doubled it. Now, investigators discover a text from Suzanne to her friend and it says, he won't speak of divorce. I feel no peace when he's here. I wouldn't feel safe when I'm alone with him. So now she has two texts for sure that we know of that says, I wouldn't feel safe when I'm alone with him. And also he's been physically and emotionally abusive. Barry then became the prime suspect and talked about that in the show. They think they know how Barry killed Suzanne. And during the search, there was quite a bit of searches. And the first one, I believe, was 10 or 11 days that home search was, which is a long time. And to a forensic expert, they talked about they're recreating a crime scene if they're staying there for 10 days or 10 or 11 days. So they searched the home, the family's vehicles, and it said, and I quote, in the special, it says, Barry kept talking to anyone with a badge weeks and months and Barry remained center of the investigation. Then they went on to talk about a tranquilizer cap that they found in the dryer and it's to a dart that tranquilizes animals. And the prosecution's theory, they said, was at some point when Barry came home, he snapped and murdered Suzanne and then he used the tranquilizer dart um, that you would use on an animal. But they said there was no working rifle in the home that, that did that because something was broken on it from my memory, but they didn't say that in the special. And Barry told investigators that he was an experienced tranquilizer shooter because he knew how to load the darts and he knew how to load the darts with these uh, chemicals because he used it on deer that he would tranquilize the deer and steal their antlers. Now they said that it takes four to 20 minutes for an animal the size of a deer to drop. And they asked, you know, could that have happened to Suzanne? And they believe that that's one of their theories that the phone pinged around the house because he was chasing Suzanne, not chipmunks after he shot her. And they did talk about a door broken in the house, which is to the master bedroom, and that um, there could have been a chase and then a struggle. Now, interesting here too, they didn't mention it, but the authorities went back to the previous homeowners and asked if that door jam or the, the door um, frame was broken before, and they said no. They had a demonstration in the show by the owner of Animal Care and Equipment Services, and he showed the rifle and the darts, and he actually shot it, he demonstrated it. He said if Suzanne was struck, that he doesn't think she would get very far, and it could be lethal to a human. And remember, Suzanne was only 115 pounds, she was 5'3", 5'4", something like that, so uh, she's not very big. And they closed it off talking about the authorities taking an into account the day with Barry having scratches on his arms, he had defensive wounds, they took in the circumstantial evidence, the contradictory statements, because he made quite a few, and his suspicious behavior, along with the truck, the texts, and the five trash runs, and they brought it all to the district attorney, and Barry was arrested in May of 2021. And as I said, Suzanne's body has never been found yet. 
And in the documents, they showed a clip and it says, it has become clear that Barry couldn't control Suzanne's insistence on leaving him and he resorted to something he has done his entire life, hunt and control Suzanne like he had hunted and controlled animals. Now, Barry's lawyers say this read like a soap opera. I believe it was like a soap opera. And Melinda was shown again Suzanne's sister and said, there's no winners to this story. Two families are suffering deeply. And then they talked about the judge and they talked about Barry's lawyers being high profile lawyers and Judge Patrick Murphy. And he's the one who was there at the preliminary hearing to see if they had enough to go to trial. And Judge Murphy talked about there being three scenarios, either Suzanne left willingly, Barry did it, or someone else did. And he said it's unlike Suzanne to wander off on her own because of the evidence of how loving Suzanne was, a mother, uh, she loved her girls and would do anything for them and she would never leave them. And so it's unlikely that she took off. And he talked about the abduction couldn't be easily dismissed because of in the Range Rover they found this DNA which is partial match of an unnamed man connected to three unsolved sexual assault cases in Tempe, Arizona, Phoenix, and Chicago. So obviously this big question is how the heck did the DNA get in the car? My question is though, when did that DNA get into that car? When did they swab the vehicle? And that partial match is a partial match. It doesn't fully match the unnamed man connected to these three unsolved cases. It could be a cousin, it could be all kinds of things. It's not the person, it's a partial match. Partial's partial. It doesn't mean like partial fingerprint, it means it's a partial DNA match. So um, it's not gonna be a full match, otherwise that'd be the dude. So Judge Murphy ended up saying back in September that the proof is not evident or presumption great, but he did rule that there is probable cause to go to trial. So he did set the bond at $500,000 cash bond, which Barry bonded out and he had to wear an ankle monitor. However, and they didn't speak about this and it's important, Barry, even though he had an ankle monitor on, he's living right near where his old home was and his ankle monitor doesn't work. He has to go into town every day in order for it to work and check in. So I'm curious why they didn't include that information because I think that's a huge piece of information. And his daughters are standing firm behind their dad and supporting their father. We've seen that over and over. And now it says Barry through, their, through lawyers declined to be interviewed or a statement citing court rules and orders. And Barry's attorneys launched a civil suit and they claim that prosecutors and investigators withheld evidence and they say that the prosecutors presented the evidence after the preliminary and that they now know the DNA matches. So nothing else is known, they haven't been released any of that publicly, but it is said that it's going to be hard for the prosecution. Now Melinda is on again in this show and says that she thinks about Barry a lot and she wishes that he would just tell the truth about what happened. She said, please do the right thing, Barry, please do the right thing. And she said she wanted her nieces to know, Macy and Mallory, she said, your mother would have laid down her life for you girls. She would never leave you, she would never forsake you, she loved you with her whole being. Now, Judge Patrick Murphy disqualified himself based on a potential conflict of interest because Shoshana Dark, who is Barry's girlfriend, is a witness in the case and Judge Murphy is friends with Shoshana's lawyer. So hopefully you got all that. Uh, so a new judge has been appointed and it's now Judge Lama. So Barry's trial is scheduled for May 2022 and there's a motions hearing which as of the time of this recording it's today and tomorrow and they're doing a motions hearing regarding a change of venue and Barry wants to be able to see his girls, etc. So stay tuned for that. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. What else do you wish that they would have included in the special? And let me know your thoughts about the chipmunks. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please like and please share.
Thank you so much for watching. See you soon.